now on BBC One, Patrick Moore with The Sky at Night. For thousands of years, men could do no more than look up at the night sky with the naked eye. Then, in the early 17th century, telescopes were invented, and our whole view of the universe changed. The first great telescope observer was, of course, Galileo, who made a series of spectacular discoveries with his small refractor. He saw the craters of the moon, that orbiting the planet Jupiter were four bright satellites. The Saturn had a strange appearance in his telescope. This was later seen to be at the rings. And the myriad stars that formed the dusty band of the Milky Way. In 1671, Sir Isaac Newton presented the first reflecting telescope to the Royal Society. And as telescopes became more and more effective, our knowledge of the universe increased. The largest refractors were built at the end of the 19th century, such as the 40-inch at the Yerkes Observatory in the United States brought into use in 1895. However, a lens has to be supported all around its edges, and if too large, it'll distort under its own weight. So probably, the Yerkes refractor will never be surpassed. This disadvantage, of course, does not apply to mirrors. In 1917, the largest reflector was the Hooker 100 inch at Mount Wilson. This remained in the class of its own until 1948, when the Hale 200 inch was completed at Mount Palomar. Today, there are reflecting telescopes of many kinds. Some have segmented mirrors. For example, each of the two giant Keck telescopes has a 9.8 metre mirror made of 36 segments. To get the best seeing conditions, the telescope sits at almost 14,000 feet on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. In Chile, in the Atacama Desert, where it rains on average only once every 100 years, the air is particularly clear still and dry. Here we find the four 8.2 metre mirrors of the very large telescope, or VLT. Each has produced many breathtaking images of faint, distant objects. Uh, but by next year, the lights from these four large mirrors will be coherently combined by an interferometer. And in this mode, the telescope will operate as a 120 metre mirror with an angular resolution of one milli arc second. But however large and well-placed these telescopes are, they have one common disadvantage. They have to peer through the Earth's dirty, unsteady atmosphere. And the only way to overcome this is to go up into space. In 1990, NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope, the HST, which orbits 600 kilometers above the Earth, which gives its 2.4 meter mirror an advantage. And it too produces superb images, such as this deep field image showing thousands of faint galaxies which were first seen by the HST. It's not only the increasing size of telescopes which counts, it's methods too. For decades we depended upon the photographic plate and now that's being superseded by the CCD, the charged couple device. Instead of a conventional film bearing camera, an electronic camera is used which has a charged couple device or CCD to collect the light. A CCD has a mosaic of tiny sensors converting the light into electric charges and that in turn can be fed into a computer to produce the image. Their big advantage is that they are far more sensitive than any photograph and therefore they can allow fainter objects to be imaged. In this program we're going to show you how CCDs are used and we've come to a long Crendon in Oxfordshire and behind me is the dome of the new very exciting Crendon Observatory. Now, I'm going to show you two photographs. Both are of the same object, the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant 6,000 light years away. Here they are. Now, one of these photographs was taken with the VLT, or Very Large Telescope in Chile, part of the world's most powerful telescope. The other was taken right here in Crendon. Now, which is which? Look carefully. In fact, the Crendon picture is one at the top. Now, what's remarkable is this observatory is owned by Gordon Rogers, 
an amateur observatory, as you can see, marvellous pictures, and those two images are really very alike. So we've come down here to ask Gordon Rogers just how it's done. Well, Gordon, we are delighted you can join us on the sky at night. It's a most impressive observatory. Um, will you be kind enough to take us on a guided tour? Now, we're standing in an ash dome, mm -hmm. uh, which was made um, near Chicago. Yes. What diameter is the dome? The diameter is 10 feet 6 inches. And, of course, the heart of the whole observatory is this splendid telescope. Yes, the telescope is um, uh, Mead 16-inch smith cassegrain and on top of it rides the Takahashi 5-inch refractor. Well, what do you use that for, mainly? Use that mainly for the larger ob objects, as you know, where some galaxies are huge. Uh, Andromeda is five times mm -hmm. as wide as uh, the Moon, and even with the Takahashi, I can only get one-fifth of Andromeda. The most important device, obviously, is the CCD. Yes, this is the CCD camera, which has two chips one large chip for imaging purposes and a small chip on which to place the guide star uh, for the purposes of guiding the telescope. The light path comes down through the telescope through the robotic focuser which can be operated from the computer room then through the adaptive optics unit. I think some people may not know quite what that is. Now that, that to me is uh, an amazing uh, piece of apparatus uh, it comprises a computer-controlled mirror which enables fine adjustments for the tracking of the telescope. In fact, if you're lucky enough to get a really bright guide star, you can then guide as many as 50 times per second, and at that rate, the, the unit will start to compensate for the mo atmospheric movement. So, having passed through the adaptive optics unit, the light path goes to the colour filter here. Yeah. That enables you to place in the light path filters either clear, red, green or blue. Well, it's a most impressive observatory, but of course that's only the start. Uh, a much of all work is done not in the room itself, but down in the study. Down to the computer room, yes. So let's go down there. Right. Coming down here to the study, I'm immediately faced with not one computer, but two. Uh, why the pair, Gordon? Well, Patrick, there are two computers in that I use this one to control the telescope, and this computer to control the CCD camera. You actually move the telescope from here, in fact. You operate the telescope by manipulation with this software system. Uh, I can enlarge the scale of uh, where the telescope is pointing now, and the telescope is pointing at Venus. I can click on an object elsewhere, and the telescope will train to it. And, of course, the photographs come up on the next computer. Photographs come up on this computer. Uh, that is uh, an original photograph. And the focusing is done by watching the guide star on this computer and married up with the readout on the focusing device there. So when you're observing, you're not actually in the dome itself at all? I hope not to be in the dome too much, but there are times when I have to go up there. The observatory is amazingly well equipped. What first sparked off your interest? Well, my interest was sparked on the 13th of June, 1994, when uh, at about 9.30 I was looking at a new moon uh, and saw something peculiar there. So that was what sparked me. I thought I needed to have the means to record something that I saw in the skies. What did you actually see? I saw three white blobs, um, one of them having a stem issuing from a crater. Which crater? Stem, I think it was in the vicinity of Sandbeck. Oh, yes. It was um, a stem of a milk chocolate colour which dissipated into a white cloud. At the time I thought it might have been volcanic activity. The next day everything was back to normal, clearly wasn't. So I think what I actually saw was three asteroids hitting the moon. Uh, so that's what we got started and that, uh, that led to uh, an eight inch telescope which was um, mounted on the uh, patio. And of course you set it up and then it become cloudy, you bring it in. Yes. I then bought the uh, 16 inch Mead which was housed in an observatory with a slide off roof. But again, every time the, the weather clouded in, you lost focus, you lost the setup. And I thought, I really need an observatory. How long was it between the time you decided to build the observatory and first light? It took uh, about 15 months. Uh, the, uh, uh, initially, of course, uh, getting planning permission was uh, a big hurdle to overcome. Oh, yes. But I was very fortunate in having tremendous support from neighbors, because without that, I would not have got no. consent. 
and planning office were um, very helpful, uh, so I can't count myself lucky to have got consent. I knew that the observatory was to be constructed on bad ground um, from previous experience, um, so the first step was to take soil tom samples to a depth of 11 meters, which entailed the construction then of, of 8 meters deep um, piles with a reinforced uh, concrete cap. Of course, you had to go up, otherwise you had too many had trees around. Had to go up, and had to go up uh, 20 feet, so a uh, 2 feet 6 inch pier uh, uh, with 8 tons of concrete was quite an undertaking. Uh, my son decided that uh, he would construct this within a uh, reinforced plastic sewer pipe, uh, slip down over the um, reinforcing material. Our worry was it would burst, the concrete yes. would burst at the bottom of the pier, right. and my wife Margaret would not be happy with eight tons of going off concrete outside her kitchen window. I'm sure she wouldn't. And I heaved a great sigh of relief when the pier actually stood and the uh, concrete had gone off. When you had your pillar, what about getting the dome up there? Um, well, I originally the dome arrived uh, by container, um, by sea container, and that was daunting when we opened the container and this myriad of parts um, was in front of us. But the construction manual ran to 76 pages and was very good. And the parts did slot together, um, and uh, it was less daunting than I feared it would be to build it. And then getting the telescope in, was that a real problem? Uh, we were fortunate to have the hoist for the construction, so to get the pedestal up was no difficulty. Um, and we um, got the uh, telescope up uh, with the help of ropes. You have your telescope, you're there. How long did it take to become really fully operational and begin a proper observing program? Well, I'm slowly getting there. It's taken a long time. I mean, it's, I've been CCD imaging for uh, five years now, and uh, there's still an awful lot to learn. Well, you're certainly getting splendid results. Can you take us through the procedure of getting a really good galaxy picture? The first thing you have to do, obviously, is to find it. Indeed, and uh, with the help of uh, this software, finding it is no difficulty. I can click on the galaxy I want to go to, I command the telescope to go to that galaxy, and it'll do that. Uh, what I do then is I then find a bright star near that galaxy, I then go to that star, and I then focus the, t the uh, camera and also calibrate the camera, which is uh, a necessary step. Yes. Having done that, I then go back to the galaxy, exactly centre of the galaxy, and then hope to find there's a guide star it, uh, centred on the guide ship. Usually there's not. I then have to find the guide star, fine-tune the focus, and then I'm ready to start imaging. This is the uh, image as it da uh, downloads from the CCD camera. Uh, the first thing you have to do is to try and get rid of all these speckles, and you do that by subtracting a dark frame, which is a, an image of the same duration as the main exposure. That's a dark frame with the speckles. Take that away, you get the cleaned up frame. And then there's a further refinement of taking away a flat field. That's the flat field. Take that away and you have a slightly improved image. The next uh, application I applied here was uh, a, a sharpening algorithm, which just brought out a little more detail, you'll see there. And then uh, digital development, which brought out a lot of detail in the center of the galaxy. So that is my black and white uh, luminance image. The same treatment applied to red, green, and blue gave those images. Well, now you have your images, and uh, next thing, combine them to make next the final thing you picture. Put, you put them together, and that's your, uh, your color picture. You see it's a little burned out in the middle. By layering um, a less exposed image beneath that image, I was able to bring out the center section of the galaxy for the final picture there. And you know, that picture, is better than the best professional pictures would have been of course, half a century ago. Oh. Congratulations, Gordon. Mm, amateurs are catching up. They've caught up. <laughs> and I think, Gordon, at this stage, if we may, can we please see some of your favorite pictures? You certainly can, Patrick. Can we start with uh, the Flame Nebula? The Gaseous Nebula. Uh, Gaseous Nebula, um, NGC 2024. You'll see that uh, the Guy Star is a lovely bright Guy Star, but it's uh, impinging in the, on the green in the image here. Yes, indeed. Uh, but uh, I was very pleased with the general image. Uh, ah, the Needle Galaxy this time. Indeed. From your catalogue, uh, uh, object number 38 of Caldwell catalogue.
And look at the dark material they're crossing the nucleus. It's a wonderful, absolutely stunning galaxy, one it of my indeed. favorites. It is indeed. Then another galaxy, um, Whale Galaxy, um, again from your catalogue, uh, at a distance of uh, around 20 million light years. You see a much fainter galaxy. You'll see there. here, yes, there's a, a background galaxy there. Distant galaxy. Um, that's a lovely spiral. Caldwell 12, of Caldwell NGC, 12. and in Cepheus, a nun on Northern. A lovely spiral. Lovely spiral galaxy. Quite faint. It took uh, a lot of uh, luminous imaging. Um, it was uh, one hour of image to get the uh, black and white. Because it's not, not in Messier's catalogue, but it's one of the faintest in the Caldwell. But you see a lot of detail there. Indeed, you do. What about my own particular subject, the moon? I did like this uh, image of. Uh, Crater Clavius. High terrace wall, the central peak, a yeah. string of craters across the floor, 145 miles across. I yeah. never tire of looking at that. No, it's, it's a beautiful object. Ah, the old favourite, the horse's head in all around, yeah. a mass of dark gas coming up the light of stars beyond, a favourite object. Yes, I think uh, every astronomer is, uh, holds that with uh, a lot of affection. And you know, it's surprisingly difficult to see visually that one. It is indeed, yes. And here, of course, the Orion Nebula, M42, the most photographed of all, I suppose, and the most famous nebula in the sky. That's a lovely picture, Gordon. Yes, a stunning object, always uh, gripping through the telescope. Uh, but, of course, it's so bright um, that uh, you have to uh, take a number of images uh, and uh, ex vary the exposures so that you can have uh, a short exposure for the base layer and then gradually longer images uh, that can be merged together in the computer to get the core. I think one point we ought to bring out here, these colours in the pictures, they are perfectly genuine, but of course, look through a telescope and you won't see them, but they're, 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 not, they're not vivid enough. Yes, you say very little colour through the telescope. This observatory is as well equipped as any amateur observatory in the country, probably in the entire world, but not everyone can go to those lengths. Well, anyone who wants to get started, how do they go about it, Gordon? Well, Patrick, uh, astronomers may not be the prettiest or best dressed people in the world. But they are very friendly and very helpful. And if you join uh, your local astronomy club, you'll find there's a wealth of experience and a very willing uh, number of people, only too happy to uh, point you in the right direction. Of course, astronomically, I'm a dinosaur. My telescope is not computerized. It's a 15-inch reflector and used almost entirely upon the moon and planets. You can today buy uh, a fully computerized telescope um, for, I think, under 500 pounds now that you can set up and will actually find its way around the sky. But I have to blame you for the whole thing because you were the man who told me where to go to buy my first proper telescope. Well, it certainly paid off. Gordon, congratulations. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Don't forget our website, www.bbc.co.uk UK slash sky at night, or CFAX page 620. And finally, on June 31st, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun. I'm afraid you won't see it from here. You've got to go to Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, or Mozambique. And uh, if you do decide to go, I hope you have better luck than I did in August 1999, sitting under an umbrella in Falmouth. Good night. <laughs>